massive thanks to, to Yuki and to Monica for that. I hope you found that a useful working lunch. Um, we're going to get straight on, I think, with, uh, with our next session. Um, we have a lot to squeeze in this afternoon. And this is session three, which is on mobilizing assets and portfolio allocation for transition. The moderator will be Harry Cho, who is Managing Director and Head of Sustainability and Sustainable Finance at SGX Group. The, uh, the panelists will be Gabriel Wilson-Otto, who's Head of Sustainable Investing Strategy at Fidelity International. Corinne Pung, who is the Regional Head of Equities Research and Stewardship at AIA Group. Tice Arton, who is CEO of APG Asset Management Asia. And Rida Wirakusama, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Indonesian Investment Authority. Uh, in a moment, they'll come to the stage. Just in the meantime, remember, use the Slido QR code to ask your questions. Please continue to use the Swap Card app if you want to meet up with people. But please uh, join me in welcoming to the stage our panelists for session three. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been a super content-rich day so far, right? It's a lot to be taking in. Um, we're trying to make the day as practical as possible. And um, I think uh, we're going to be talking really in this panel a bit more about when the rubber hits the road. Um, there's been some very good concepts and strategy that came up um, and examples in the morning. Um, and so now we're going to be talking about um, what is actually being done to mobilize the assets for um, portfolio as well as um, asset allocation. So um, with me, I've got a, an esteemed panel um, with um, quite varied views and different asset classes. So I hope it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Okay, so... Um, Rubber hits the road, how do we put the commitments to action and what's actually being done? Um, I think we heard earlier today that it is a somewhat of a balanced picture out here and the speed may vary, but then how do we get that as credible as possible? So um, the first question I want to ask all the panelists is um, if you look at things today, how integral is embedding supporting of climate transition into um, actually the asset allocation and the portfolio allocation itself. And what are some of the key barriers and challenges that you face? And you know, hopefully, how do you overcome those? So we're going to spend a little bit longer time in this first question. So maybe I can go with Thais first. Thanks, uh, Harry. Um, I think the overarching principle is that our clients have very deliberately decided that they wanted to have their portfolios be net zero in 2050. Um, and then, to be honest, I was, was a bit thrown off guard by your, by your question on asset allocation, because I thought, oh, how do we do that? Because, well, we need to generate returns, and therefore we need a certain amount of equity risk premium. Uh, uh, regulatory requirements imply that we need to have some, fi some fixed income in there and there's not a dedicated asset category that we label as transition finance or uh, 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 whatever sustainable development goal you can, can come up with. So I think the overarching goal, uh, uh, and, and I can actually picture that a bit as an overlay strategy, is very much to meet these these net zero requirements. So our shareholder, main client as well, has said, I want to be net zero in 2050 and to be in line with Paris 1.5 uh, uh, scenario that implies that by 2030, so that's more or less in six years, uh, compared to uh, 2019 or 2020, the portfolio, the carbon footprint needs to be halved. Um, but that has to be implemented within each and every asset category. So then it boils down to the specific investments uh, that you do to uh, uh, assess 
well, does this fit in my portfolio if I want to meet that goal? So then it becomes immediately specific to the company and we assess each and every company, um, do they also subscribe to net zero in 2050? Um, do they have the proper governance in place to make sure that that actually happens? Um, are they transparent about their climate impact uh, uh, and the improvements that they want to make? Is pay uh, uh, related to achieving these goals? Because if that's not the case, then probably we will vote against the uh, 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 payment structure at the shareholder meeting um, because then it's not that likely that you're going to meet it. So based on all these criteria, then we decide is this a company that deserves a place in our portfolio. If not, then the financial returns might be really great, but then you do not deserve a place in our portfolio because we can achieve the returns that we need. Uh, also by um, uh, uh, in restricting the universe more or less to these type of, of companies. So um, before we move on, so how, um, so today the reality in Asia is, um, and I don't have the statistics to hand, but the number of companies uh, and investors or financiers who committed to 2050 is probably in the minority still today. So how do you apply that top-down mandate that you have to align your whole portfolio to 2050 to, for example, Asia, including the emerging markets? Well, I think Asia um, plays a very important role in the entire um, uh, uh, climate transition. Uh, it's it's um, 50% of global GDP, 70% of global growth, also 60% of global emissions. And, and with elevating maybe two to three billion people to middle income class, the energy use will go up in the region as well. So that's, that's more or less a, m m complicating um, uh, the, the challenge even more. Um, so there's a couple of, of leeways or exceptions that, yes, um, we look at these companies, but if you're, for example, um, uh, have a credible transition strategy, uh, even you might not have signed up because you don't know about it or you're not aware that that for us is really important to be a shareholder, and then we will engage with you uh, um, uh, uh, and, and, and actually are willing to help you out on achieving, uh, getting these, these I'd say almost formalities in place because I think that's one of the issues that sometimes the data, uh, if you're talking about impediments and barriers, that the data is not available. There might be a great company out here but doesn't, that does not realize that if they're not publishing this report, then you fall off the list because you didn't tick a box. Well, uh, if that's what it's required, uh, uh, then that's an easy fix in, in, in my view. So now you can see link already between this session to the previous session you're in on transition planning. Um, as Thais just mentioned, that's an indication for APG that companies in Asia Pacific, um, even if they're not fully aligned, right, 2050, it's, it's a clear indication that they're on the right pathway. Um, can I ask the same question? Um, let's let's um, perhaps uh, jump to, um, actually let's continue with asset owners, so Corinne. Um, yeah, thank you, Harry, and thanks for having me. So um, as an asset owner, we work with um, uh, very established uh, third-party external fund managers to manage some of our funds. And so this is where we really try to find like-minded um, uh, managers uh, who adopt uh, best practices on the ESG front, um, like Fidelity, Robico, uh, are also managing some of our uh, money and we continue to oversee uh, their ESG practices. We have regular dialogues with them. I, had, I met Gabriel just earlier this week um, to understand Fidelity's uh, approach uh, to sustainability. Now, for our own in-house um, managed uh, assets, um, we are very bottom-up in the way we drive our capital allocation. So, um, we have 70 research analysts on the ground for credit and equity, and um, that they are based in uh, 12 markets in Asia. 
So we develop our own uh, in-house ESG uh, rating scorecard, um, you know, measuring the percentage of green revenues the company has, the emission reduction targets, and so on. Um, and and uh, basically, um, those companies that are rated uh, more highly versus their sector peers um, will basically um, have a higher valuation premium in terms of the fair value uh, to uh, for the equity side and also in terms of their their uh, rating and um, credit limit on, on the fixed income side and that actually impacts uh, our research team's investment recommendations to our managers and uh, influences their portfolio construction uh, decision and then the third thing we did was about two years ago we actually um, started to do um, more negative screens as well um, and we have actually looked at hard to abate sectors like coal mining and coal-fired power plants and for our general accounts uh, we have actually exited uh, companies involved in coal mining and coal-fired power operations. Thank you. Thanks for that Corinne. So um, um, let me go to Gabrielle. Um, Gabrielle would you be able to give uh, perspective including Asia emerging markets and um, as an asset manager, one of the uh, probably one of the most recognized names uh, globally um, and how you also support your clients on that journey too. So you've heard loud and clear that our clients are demanding that we achieve net zero within portfolios and how we operate. We also see this as completely consistent with fiduciary duty. Um, you mentioned that if you're looking at the number of companies that have signed up to net zero in Asia, it might be a smaller number. If we look at the number of economies and countries that have signed up to achieving net zero or put themselves on a net zero pathway through policy or stated ambition, it's actually most large markets and economies that have done it. So clearly that represents a policy gap where if that policy ambition is achieved, could be very disruptive for portfolio companies. So if we're thinking about how we need to invest and manage a transition and look at asset allocation or different tools that we have to manage that, we think of it from an entity level where we have our own targets for net zero for Fidelity International, net zero by 2050, halving our carbon emissions by 2030 from a 2020 baseline. It will sound familiar because it was exactly the targets that were just mentioned <laughs> by TIS at APG. Um, so this is what we're doing at an entity level. If you look at how that filters down into actual portfolio management and stock selection decisions, we really try and target this from a systematic level as well as a portfolio level and individual issuer level. So what that means is at the system, system level, we think it's critical to be able to engage with policymakers to set the right framework for an orderly and planned transition. Policy certainty, mandatory disclosure, transition plans are fantastic tools to actually improve transparency and help direct capital towards the most appropriate areas of the market. So we see participation in those system level changes as a critical component of our role as an asset manager. At a portfolio level, there are various tools that we have in order to evaluate and allocate capital to companies here. We have individual solutions, which are 100% targeted with mitigating climate risk. Um, so these will be more thematic or impact funds. We also have tools such as a climate rating to evaluate a company's progression towards net zero. And this allows us to evaluate the progression of our more generic or mainstream portfolios and how climate risk is being appropriately managed from investee companies. And then the final tool at an individual um, company level is that direct engagement with issuers to highlight why we believe that this is something that needs to be factored into strategy, into disclosure, and also into the company's operational practices. So it's really about trying to take it from that system level, which targets it at various stages, with different tools at portfolio level, solution level, and issuer level. Great. Um, so I'm going to come back to each of you to perhaps try to bring this to life with any concrete examples that you have that might be helpful for the portfolio companies in the audience, as well as other financiers who might be looking for um, examples and inspiration. But before we get to that, um, Pak Rida, um, I'd like to come to you. 
obviously IIA is um, a, a little bit younger um, than um, some of the other institutions here. So perhaps you can share a little bit about um, Indonesia Investment Authority and how you are when you set out the when you set out to set up IIA. What were some of the considerations in capital allocation or um, asset allocation, portfolio allocation to support the climate transition, which of course Indonesia is very much so on the journey of. Uh, just a little correction, uh, we call ourselves, or our president call ourselves INA, INA, um, even though, as Harry said, IIA perhaps is Indonesia Investment Authority. Um, why the president um, call us INA? Because when we compete in the Olympics or whatever, it's called INA, so it, it is what it is. Um, when I, I'm sorry to sidetrack a bit, um, when we try to actually find in, uh, we found out that there's a competing organization called International Nurse Association. <laughs> so, we, um, but we're happy to be here. Um, we are 662 working days young. So we are an early, we are a very young organization. We are like the Tomasek of Indonesia. Um, we thought since we are young, why do we go into transition like the energy? Why do you go to fossil fuels and then into renewable? Why don't you go straight to renewables? So the way we set up INA, we actually set in four industry verticals. The first one is infrastructure. Um, um, the second one is digital. The third one is healthcare. And the fourth one is squarely on you know, energy transition and renewables. So that is already part of, so far, um, we have deployed over three, you know, almost three and a half billion dollars, about 20, 20%, 25% are in the areas of green. So we wanted to go right, you know, since the get-go, rather than going through a transition. Uh, we could talk a lot about the challenges. I just wanted to, to let you guys know that, um, you know, as a young organization, we want to set it uh, up right at the first time. But I also wanted to make just a number of comments that uh, net zero or energy transitions are different from different countries, from different levels. That's why there's something called just transition for Singapore, uh, which is earning you know eighty thousand dollars income per capita, is different than Indonesia, which is at four thousand nine hundred US dollar income per capita. So if the world is asked to actually go down, it is a bit unfair for us that may have to go through an advancement of economy to actually go down from already a very low level, is to give you an example, 14 uh, ton carbon per capita in the US and we are only at two. So we are already very low, if we were to be pushed down, you know, it, it's gonna be not that, that simple. So I think um, just to make sure that there are dimensions that people can talk about, one of the exciting things for me at least um, about the context of the rich countries versus emerging markets or developed and developing nation is that the developing nations, as they are growing, the developed nations can actually provide technologies and the new market um, to actually build um, energy sources green from the get-go. Um, so it could provide win-win for both sides. I just wanted to make sure that people understand, you can't really just say, you know, let's go to net zero, everybody's the same, everybody go down at the same time because it's not, it's not the same. Great, thank you for that. And thank you for the correction as well. I should have known better. Um, so um, by the way, so for those in the audience, um, we do have the QR code for sending in through any burning questions you have. Please do send them through and we can review them and try to answer as many of them as possible during this session. Um, so then just coming back to uh, all four panelists, um, are there some concrete examples that you can give you know, to um, companies, right, uh, who are operating out here. So how in practice um, are you supporting with your allocation decisions, the transition that the companies have to go under? So we really, you know, discuss, I think we're broadly all in agreement that supporting the real economy is a, a, a key principle that we all have to support. But of course, from um, portfolio perspective and mandate perspective is not as straightforward as that sometimes. So do you have any examples how some of the allocation decisions are supporting that transition? Well, um, let me go first again. Um, 
I, th I think, uh, and maybe that's not immediately uh, uh, relevant for, for the individual um, companies that we've alluded on, on the requirements that, that we said already earlier. Um, but if you're talking about asset allocation, so, so for us, the, the most, uh, the, the overarching principle is to move the portfolio towards net zero. Um, and, but to keep us on our toes, uh, uh, our clients do put in place uh, um, uh, hard targets on what to achieve. So uh, again, ABP, our main shareholder, and the Civil Servant Pension Fund wants to have 30 billion euros invested in uh, a climate transition. Um, and that is both mitigation as well as adaptation. And of that 30, 10 billion should be impact. And you could, but that can be in any asset category as I, as I explained before. So that's, that's specific targets that you, uh, uh, that we need to meet. Um, but I think that one, and that came up in a couple of other discussions already as well, but something important that I would like to stress is that you can, you can make your portfolio green by just diverting your flows. But of course, the hard work is in uh, helping companies make this transition and to have a real world impact. Uh, you, you can divert your flows and say, now I'm done, uh, uh, but you didn't make a change to the real world. And that's where the, the difficulty also in measurement comes in. But that should, in my view, very much be the guiding principle in your engagement with companies. And that, that sometimes makes that choices are difficult or nuanced. Um, and it might be better, uh, thinking about Indonesia, that instead of making this marginal improvement somewhere in Europe, uh, uh, it's better to help them to skip uh, um, uh, energy production with coal. Because sea levels rise across the globe and not just in Indonesia or in the Netherlands. Great, thanks for that. Um, Corinne, do you have any? Um, for us, um, we've been broadening our portfolio inclusion. So if the company, because we have very long-term relationships with our investing companies, and if they're able to prove that um, um, the new capital that they're raising um, is, is going to uh, renewable energy, um, we are happy to support that. And we've been actually stepping up on our investments in uh, ESG bonds. We've, as of end of last year, we already invested in 4.3 billion uh, in ESG bonds. Um, and also that continuous engagement um, really helps. Um, remember I talked about um, divestment, which was our in a way, a last resort for the coal mining and coal-fired power plants that we did uh, two years back. But um, we continued our dialogue with um, the investing companies, even though we actually divested them. And um, we're uh, very encouraged uh, to see that some of them have actually accelerated their energy transition uh, pathways and plans. Some of them um, uh, are back in our portfolios again uh, two years on uh, because of that. And just completely building on some of the points that were raised earlier, I think that one of the most important elements here is context-specific analysis. So there isn't one global standard that we can hold all companies to. And the examples of that, specifically for Asia, are around the, our approach to thermal coal power generation. We set very different standards for companies that are in Europe versus companies that are in Asia when we're assessing them. We also strongly believe that engagement for transition is a critical pathway of being able to reward companies that are on that right trajectory by making them more eligible for a wider range of our portfolios. So again, I think the, the core element here really comes down to engagement. It comes down to context-specific analysis to ensure that the performance of an issuer is appropriate within the market and the local context. The points that were raised on Indonesia I couldn't agree more with. We have to be very aware that we're actually able to encourage participation and encourage development in the right direction, not just have blanket exclusions or refusing to participate. And this is one of the main challenges that I actually see is part of the complexity associated with that analysis. It does take a lot of work to be able to dig down on an instrument level basis and to be able to do this work. 
there is a lack of global standards on transition. We don't have those context-specific data sets and context-specific transition pathways that were highlighted earlier. And for me, this is one of the key reasons why if we look at the way that developed market impact investing or funding is directed, only 8% of it actually flows down to emerging markets or areas where that capital could actually be put to a very significant use. And that complexity and lack of transparency is one of the key problems here. So from our perspective, we're lucky to have a very large network of analysts of 180 to 200 people that can do that context-specific analysis embedded within the individual markets. And for us, it's about partnership with investee companies to work on ambition, accountability, and action towards net zero. So it's also about how much can you improve, not necessarily where are you coming from entirely. So it's not just about the baseline, it's about what's the potential for improvement. Great. I, I want to come back to, on a question related to that. Um, Takrida. Yeah, so um, there's a couple things. Um, I like the terms when the rubber meets the road. Um, oftentimes, I'm extremely happy that I'm yet again invited to yet again another sustainability event. But sometimes, <laughs> rather cynical, we talk a lot, but I think it's as important to actually see it in action. Um, INA. Um, trying to build uh, the future through partnering with many institutions. Uh, that's philosophy number one. ESG is one of our core principle and also one of our um, um, uh, filters in, in, in investing. So far, we've done four deals. The first one is we invested in uh, a company called uh, uh, Geothermal, Pertamina Geothermal, where we and one of the largest renewable companies in the world, Masdar, invested in the geothermal company. It's listed. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know if you guys are in there, the share price had gone up 75%. So that's, again, an example of how people actually really like the theme of sustainability. Uh, geothermal is a company that actually is uh, doing really well uh, because it is one of the base load uh, in, in power, as you, as you know. And yes, you can make money in sustainability uh, team. Uh, so that's one we have, uh, we have done. Uh, we also have signed um, a platform called Energy Transition Mechanism to try to take the coal uh, power plant and retire them early. And we are working with quite a number of institutions, um, you know, whether it's uh, Rockefeller Foundations or IKEA Foundation or Bezos Foundations and you know, quite a number of other institutions to try to uh, take out coal, because we have many coal, coal power plants, take them, shorten their life, and then, and then work on replacing them with, uh, with, with renewables. The third one that we actually have done is we signed an, uh, an agreement and joint venture with one of the, in fact, the largest uh, battery manufacturing companies in the world to invest in the whole EV ecosystem. Um, we welcome uh, anybody who wants to, you know, come and work with us. Um, the last one is we actually signed with a deal with uh, a pollination group on, on trying to do the nature-based solutions, especially preserving forestry, and, you know, which we have a lot, and we wanted to rebuild that again. Uh, but I don't want to just stop thinking about sustainability just on the theme that we think, like green and, you know, climate change. If you really think about, if you really think about um, what uh, ties, I guess, if I mention, you know, transition to green. So when you invest in a company and you find out that they're not as efficient, whether it's from energy or efficiency, you could help them make green. So I really, really bought into that ideas. Um, and so when you think about efficiency, it's also about helping the, 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 the world to become more green. So oftentimes when we think about it, you know, we just talk about, you know, renewables. Yeah, so I, I think that's why um, trying to define better what transition finance actually means goes to the heart of the practical implementation. And I love what you just said, because um, also from the previous presentation that GFANS gave and also what Bain presented this morning as well, is trying to make more granular how do we actually break down the supporting of that transition. And that goes, of course, there are companies that are totally green and there are those who are driving the climate solutions there are those who are you know 
already aligned, right? Like I mentioned, but those who are on the path to aligning and those that we perhaps have to help manage the phase out. And then there's this all others who are not on that journey yet and how do we support them over time? So um, just leaning on some of the, um, the, the audience questions related to these points, um, that there were a couple of questions around sort of the, um, the, the shareholder returns and costs related uh, with the transition that some of these companies have to undergo. Um, and so that's really more on the, I think, the, more on the those who need to align or manage phase out segment. Those who are actually already winning solutions, you know, you said geothermal power plants, these have gone up by 75% in financial returns. So I'm assuming that the questions are more on the portion where the hard work needs to be done from transitioning from where it is today. So um, what are some of your views in supporting these companies? The, uh, those who are in the not, not on this journey need to do the managed phase out or need to be on the alignment. How to, um, how to support them in the capital intensive perhaps exercise that they have to undergo and the shareholder returns that you also have to think about. I will put it to Gabriel. Sure thing. Um, so I, I think it's a really good question because it's time horizon and policy come into this very, very quickly. Because if we're thinking about shareholder returns and a lot of these assets, as was highlighted earlier today, are long life assets that might be at the start of their life. And so if we're looking at capital intensive industries and undergoing a transformation, there's a definite cost to that. What could be a real critical enabler, and this was also highlighted in the presentation um, earlier today, was around policy certainty around the end point, the goal and the transition that needs to occur. If we look at what's happened, there's been comments today around carbon pricing and the extent to which that's been increasing. If we look at what's happening in Europe and the price of carbon, if we look at border adjusted carbon mechanisms and other policy levers that are starting to be deployed, this can really move the dial around the fair returns on assets over a long period of time. So if we are looking at transition, I think it's very important to be evaluating this from a long-term perspective. Um, the, the shareholder, the asset managers and asset owners on the, on the, on the, the stage are long-term investors in the way that we think about investing. And so I think that that policy angle is a critical component of thinking about returns. The other really interesting area here is the extent to which cost curves have been falling rapidly as a result of technology improvements in scale. And so I think that there was in the um, World Energy Outlook, which was just released, um, there was highlighting that solar panel costs are at the lowest they've ever been. Um, EVs are coming close to parity with other vehicles in other areas. Um, there are actually in the money investment solutions to decarbonize very significant parts of the global economy. So for me, I think that we need to be careful about breaking it into different components. There are areas where we need policy support for further action because it's not yet, econom yet economic. Green hydrogen, green steel are great examples of that. However, if we look at segments of power generation or segments of energy efficiency, there are huge solutions which can be adopted. And so when we're talking to portfolio companies about this, what we want to see is that strategic engagement with company strategy. So looking forward 5, 10, 15 years from now, how is a company thinking about the evolving policy landscape as well as those evolving cost curves? And how is that factored into their risks and opportunities that they're discussing within their own business? So it's really the awareness and engagement with the issue that we try and uh, promote. And then the policy side, we try and do more of that system, system level encouragement. Great. Any of the other panelists want to? Yes, Thais. Yes. Well, I, I'd say we're very much investors and not speculators. So it, it's not about next quarter's return and trying to guess that right and, and then selling out of the company anymore. It's already in, in how you describe us, eh? we're asset owners. We have very long-term liability, so uh, uh, we buy companies that, that we think for the long run uh, uh, provide interesting returns and are sustainable at the same time. So that, that also alludes to one of the, the, the questions, but because in doing that, you need to focus. So we can't own three or 4,000 companies and actively engage with each one of them. So we're actively reducing the number of, and, and you refer to that as inclusion. So yes, that's our inclusion policy as well. 
we're actively trying to reduce the number of companies that we hold in the portfolio so that we can spend time with them on in engaging on all of these topics and, and determining what's needed. If that's more capital, that may be something we can help out with. Uh, uh, and sometimes you reach the conclusion that to for a company to actually achieve net zero, that, that the investments are so large that there's no other way than maybe to uh, 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 indeed in restructure and or um, uh, scale down. Yeah, that's, um, that's a really fascinating point where you say you'd rather work with smaller number of portfolio companies to really help drive change, right? If I regurgitate what you just said. So um, then what you're saying is those who are showing signals of being on the pathway that, that, that you need to see in the drive towards net zero, those are the ones that you will support, right, in the long run. And we also realize that if we're investing $30,000 in a company uh, 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 from both sides, it's not really worthwhile to spend time with each other. So uh, um, uh, even though we run a, re a relatively large portfolio and large number of assets, uh, uh, also for us that requires that we, that we need to uh, focus on, on uh, um, the companies that we like and that we actively invest in and want to engage with. Um, the topic of regulation policies, uh, of course, was discussed in the previous panels, um, but it's starting to come up here, and I don't think we can avoid it. So I, I wanted to ask the panelists, um, what are some of the most important growing regulatory expectations that's on your radar, let's say in two to three and five years um, sort of time horizon, that's um, taking you to take action today and really sort of it's on your radar to to address some of those regulatory expectations. So maybe I can, um, Corinne, can I go with you first? Sure, I think um, our GFANS um, and uh, uh, Monica's um, AIGC's uh, panel actually highlighted those that are on our radar screens like MAS's uh, transition planning guidelines. Um, the ASEAN taxonomies and also um, the Hong Kong SFC's uh, new climate regime. We are going to align it quite closely with the ISSB climate standards um, because of our exposure largely being in Asia. Yeah, but I think it's actually a great thing because um, like what one of the questions suggests, right, we've been struggling with, with data uh, on the ESG front for many years now. Um, and um, these uh, regulatory changes are actually driving not just us, but our investing companies to uh, improve um, the level of disclosures they have uh, in terms of ESG data and information. Um, and with that greater transparency, it helps us to, to measure them um, better and the impact of our investments uh, and the transition pathway and uh, how we allocate capital. Yeah, thank you. Pak Rita, do you have a view? In a nutshell, I don't actually, but let me just try to uh, give some dimensions. Um, regulations or no regulations in terms of uh, moving towards net zero. Um, I think the panel mentioned that the company that are in uh, companies that are involved in, you know, green projects or company who wants to move in, they have to perform at their best. They have to increase their efficiencies. I mean, I can mention a couple things. Um, taxonomy, which is actually everywhere, um, it's key because you cannot just in a blink of an eye move from green into uh, from 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 coal into 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 green, um, so it, it is one of the regulations that I think has to be uh, extremely well developed because I, I used to be bankers all my life, and right now no bankers wants to finance anything that does that has to do with fossil fuels. All they wanted to do is on renewables, and that's actually not practical, not even realistic. You know, they have to allow some transition. So the, the, the taxonomy on that one, you know, on, on what is renewable, what is not, is, is, is key. Um, Indonesia introduced the carbon trading, but so is Malaysia, so is everywhere else as well. Um, the subsidies on EVs are there, but the single biggest enemy for energy in Indonesia, for example, is that coal is heavily subsidized. Um, not only we produce a lot of coal, 
it's also subsidized, so it's unfair for other renewables uh, to compete with coal. But is there going to be a regulation that's coming out? I don't know, and I don't, you know, I'm not privy to those anticipations. It's just that, it, you know, those people that actually are in the business of green energy has to be so much more efficient. And I think Gabriel mentioned about technology cost going down, and I think the cost of financing, if the taxonomy is right, should be should be good. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we should all not depend on regulations. Climate change is something good for all of us, for humankind anyway. So let's just do it um, because we want to do it and because it's good for, for, for all of us. So I really don't, ha don't know much about regulations. I'm not a politician. I hope I'll never be a politician, but, uh, but, <laughs> but it's not about policy changes, it's about action. No, but that's, that's a very important point. There are certain policies that are perhaps still in place, which might be an impediment to the transition in, 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 this, in the segment of the, um, the value chain where that hard transition needs to, needs to happen. So, you know, it's not something that only the private sector perhaps can resolve. Um, related to all of this, I wanted to actually address, there's quite a few, um, again, I think we can't, get away from data. So I want to actually rephrase the questions on data. Like Pakwita just mentioned, we can't make perfection, uh, I mean, the perfection would be enemy of the good, right? So um, if we were to still take action to support that transition and make it as credible as possible, just because you don't have data, my assumption is it's not going to stop people from taking action. So, um, question to um, all of you, but so Gabriel, since you said you um, have 120 analysts, did you say? 180 to 200 analysts. What do they do when they encounter companies where there's no data? So, this is exactly one of the challenges that we face, is that if we look across ESG space, I would actually argue that there is a lot of data, there is very limited helpful information around how companies are performing on, the, on a lot of ESG topics. There is a massive amount of ESG data, but does it actually lead to informed decision making or do you have the right tools to make the right decisions? So if we look at, for example, if we're looking at evaluating a company's performance on energy efficiency, transition, um, this is going into a little bit of detail, so apologies up front, but um, we have our uh, climate rating. We also have an ESG rating. In both of them, they rely on qualitative analysis as well as quantitative data. And so where we don't have data, our analyst team will actually be engaging with the company to understand their performance, culture, governance and approach on a specific topic and then to give them a rating with regards to how we believe that they're managing the exposure to that issue. So if we look at energy transition, if we're looking at carbon emissions in a carbon intensive sector, we'll be coming up with our own assessment of how a company is performing. So it doesn't preclude our ability to do analysis. Where I think the challenge is more broadly is the across the market, the consistency and transaction cost or information cost that that builds into the analysis. It means you have to have a large team to be able to bridge that data gap. It also means that our analysis is not necessarily comparable with another manager's which means that it increases communication costs when we're selling a fund or trying to communicate performance. So I think that we can get around data gaps. I don't think people should, like for a long time, data has been an excuse not to act. I think that we need to just start moving in the right direction. Um, if we're looking at which sectors are materially exposed to companies, which areas of the world, this is a big risk. You don't need data to tell you for that company. You know what they are by the sectors and exposure and profile. Um, the question is how do you then move towards accountability, progress and, before, and improving performance on those topics? That, that reminds me of a recent conversation and this, that's not the topic today, but uh, there was a closed door discussion on nature. And at uh, the moment, the topic of how do you actually create solutions and product, financial solutions and products related to supporting um, biodiversity and nature, the first, the first thing a number of PMs uh, or as a manager said was we don't have the information, we don't have the right data. But hopefully in climate, with all the effort that's been going on, as Gabrielle has been saying, um, we are um, still trying to find practical solutions. So either Thais so or Corinne, do you have any inputs on the practical solutions you're finding to overcome this challenge? 
Yes, um, we do exactly what Gabriel does for our in-house uh, portfolios. Um, one, you know, suggestion we have we have is or what we practice, for example, for state-owned enterprises in China, where you know they don't disclose like the climate or emissions data, is that um, we will use proxies. For example, some of these SOEs uh, tend to be conglomerates, like they would own uh, the real estate um, uh, company, they will own like a shipping company, and then basically, if some of these uh, happen to be listed uh, offshore or even onshore, we, we do get some of the emission data and then from there we basically um, work up the estimate for the SOE. So these are some of the uh, practical examples that we do. Um, I already told you about uh, us trying to reduce the number of companies that we need to engage with because then, then we have a larger stake, so you have more influence. Um, uh, and, and we're even trying to partner up with like-minded investors uh, um, to even create more of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, an engagement effort because together we own an even larger stake. Um, and together with some of these asset owner partners, we've created an SDI, asset owner partnership uh, um, uh, program that addresses some of these data issues as well. Because then we gave thought to, and that was not just climate that was broader, that, that was all the sustainable development goals of the United Nations that, well, what, what are the products that companies make? Um, uh, do they contribute to some of these sustainable development goals? Also making use of AI. Uh, don't ask me detailed questions on that, please. But uh, 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 it does save some analysts, uh, I understand. So with that doing that, um, uh, uh, we are then able to score and to see if your portfolio is actually contributing to these type of goals. So also to uh, climate change. So the lack of data is no excuse of, of not doing anything. So my question actually, of my answer to your question on, well, what's, what regulation is coming up and are you worried about it? I think it's the other way around. I hope regulators are catching up with what we're doing. Uh, uh, because there's urgency to it, and if we are waiting for regulators, uh, 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 th then we'll probably be too late. Hopefully, the regulators step in, and we need them, uh, 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 because that also helps to prevent, I'd say, free riders. If you're not doing anything, and you're benefiting from all the efforts of the rest, I think it's a joint effort, and that's where regulators can help out, because fundamentally, uh, uh, and that's more or less a bit implicit in what we've discussed, of course, there's kind of a mispricing in, in energy uh, uh, because it doesn't take into account carbon emissions or uh, 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 the costs that we're doing to, to our planet. So if we can address that, but that's not something that we're going to solve easily. So uh, uh, better than just start instead of waiting for um, regulators to help out. No, thanks. Thanks very much for that. And I think the regulators indeed are, um, you know, taking various actions and we don't have a regulator on the panel here. But I wanted to touch upon one of the questions here um, from Nikki on defining and measuring just an inclusive transition. Often, I think what the regulators and governments are keenly thinking about, and, and we're all aware of this, is how do you, when we think about being as ambitious as possible in the climate transition journey, how do we actually balance that with economic growth and um, the socioeconomic factors, etc.? So, um, you know, rather than sort of answering the question to the T, Pakrita, do you have a view on um, how um, Ina is thinking about the the, the philosophy behind um, you know, just an inclusive transition and how you're baking that into your um, you know, investment decisions. I think the, the world is not fair sometimes, <laughs> um, but, um, but we all generally want to do good things for, you know, for humankind. Um, the, I, I think I highlighted to you about the fact that if, if everybody uh, are tasked to reduce from whatever we have today down at the same magnitude, it would be unjust. Um, but I think the understanding of just and inclusive are quite broad meaning, um, and it's, it's, it's actually very, very hard. For us, we're not really dealing with, again, policies. We are very micro. 
we are very one transaction at a time. Um, when we um, when we look into the energy transition mechanism, which we will be speaking in COP28, is because there are many um, there are many uh, 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 fossil fuel power plants. Uh, but when the rubber meets the road, when we are trying to take out those uh, power plants, we actually have to overcome so many hurdles, not just from the regulators, from lenders, from you know, suppliers, from everywhere that basically says, um, you know, you guys, you are in coal, do and deal whatever you want to do with it, you know, we just want to deal with the, 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 the new renewable companies. It is unbelievably hard to actually even talk to bankers to say, guys, to be able to take out coal, you need a concessionary financing, you need equity investors that are actually demand less return so that you can fairly go back to the promoter to say, hey, you guys are committed to this for the next 30 years. We're going to give you same similar IRR, maybe slightly lower, but then we will take over and we will cut that shorter. For us to all go back to the state-owned electric company to say, you guys are going to, s to pay the same PPA, except that it's a much shorter time, it's much harder. So when I say just and inclusive, I mean that you know, whether it's developed nation, developing nation, it doesn't really matter, bankers are everywhere. The thought process has to be inclusive because you cannot just simply say, I'm going to turn off my electricity today that is actually, you know, powered by coal. By the way, I think Singapore is still over 60, 70% are still coal powered. You know, you cannot just say, boom, it goes to renewables. There is this transition, but the impact for many countries in the world um, in transitioning out could be quite massive. Indonesia now has 80 gigawatt of electricity installed. Maybe over 80% are actually fossil fuel based. We want to actually move towards renewables and it's gonna cost us almost $200 billion to build 64, 65 gigawatt of renewable energy source. So that's actually massive, but you know, it'll be great for everyone to actually take part, but you know, when I say just, you know, the implication is, is, is actually quite, quite broad, broad based, it's not that simple. Yeah, that's, I mean, you're, you're pulling very elegantly a very complex topic, which doesn't necessarily have a, an agreed upon answer by the global community. So may I, it's such an important topic. So can I just lean on the other panelists to see whether you have a view on how to support a transition that's, um, that, that is socially inclusive? whilst you may still have quite a strict mandate to achieve 20, 2050. Happy to jump in. Um, I, I think that this is, so the, the concept of a just transition is embedded in our approach to climate change and mitigating climate change, impacts of climate change. So within our climate policy, we explicitly state a focus on a just transition. And for us, what that means is it comes down to part of what was just said around the context specific assessment of what we're trying to achieve here. And also the fact that we're not trying to divest as rapidly as possible from as many sectors as possible. I really agreed with one of the comments earlier today that it's actually really easy to halve your portfolio emissions. You just sell a handful of companies and buy different companies. You end up with a healthcare and technology fund and hey presto, you're at 5% of your emissions previously. Does that have any real world impact? Arguably limited. So if we're thinking about just transition, it's embedded into the way that we think about engagement. It's embedded into the way that we think about, and this is addressing one of the other questions on the screen, about different standards for developed versus emerging economies. So phase out of coal within developed markets by 2030 in our policy, phase out in emerging markets by 2040. Um, again, that provides a longer period for transition. We're also in the final stages of evaluating a, a policy and framework on how to think about other 
other fossil fuels such as gas for power generation and the circumstances within which that may be an appropriate part of an energy transition and others where it may not be consistent with an appropriate energy transition in those markets. Um, so again, it's about that context specific analysis. It's about focusing on transition and it's an element that I think should have more focus is also when we're thinking about E, S or G or sustainability in general, people tend to go down one pillar. Um, the interconnectedness of different areas is huge. Um, you can't have a energy transition without focusing on the social impacts. And similarly, energy demand needs to continue to grow to uplift economic development and to bring people out of poverty in a wide range of countries globally. So again, it's about those dual objectives about trying to balance the outcomes and be more a little bit more nuanced where possible in that assessment. Great. Yeah, so um, this, there's clearly this call for, um, you know, situation-specific um, decision-making in allocating resources. Um, we've got about uh, less than two minutes, so um, I wanted to come back to each of the panelists. Whether you have one tip or one um, advice for an action that can be taken from in terms of portfolio allocation or asset allocation decisions to really help to move the needle when the rubber hits the road. Going back to my first comment. Hagrida, may I start with you? Yeah, I think I'm taking 30 seconds already. Be hopeful, be creative, be, um, humankind is extremely wonderful being, right? Um, just by keep talking about sustainability, it is just unbelievable how many progressions we are already making. There are many, many doubters still out there, but you know we just have to keep talking about it. But we have to not just talk, but also have to start actioning, even as small as possible. I think that's the only thing that I wanted to just say. We, we can actually make a difference by taking even small steps. Um, very quickly on asset allocation, I think that there are different buckets that people can focus on. And so looking at a combination of aligned pathways, so this is 1.5 degree aligned transition pathways, looking at revenue contribution to solutions and looking at transition and engagement and figuring out which of those are the right building blocks for your own circumstances and approach. For us, I think engagement is the most important. In the past, we would actually have to be very driven in the way we engage companies. But these days, we have um, you know companies coming for IPO or companies we've invested for a long time coming to us um, to ask us about what would we like to see in their ESG report um, and asking us about, you know, because we're committed to net zero as well, you know, what are some of the experiences we have. So I think engagement is the way forward uh, as we move the machinery together. Yeah, thank you. I'd say that um, uh, if you're not sure where to head on your, uh, um, uh, uh, on your transition plan or um, uh, how to move forward with engagement with companies or if you're a company and you want to be engaged with, uh, uh, I'd say reach out because we're very eager to work together with other uh, like-minded uh, uh, investors uh, uh, and together we can have even more impact. So teaming up, uh, I think, uh, makes sense uh, in these type of uh, issues. On that note, please uh, let's thank our panelists for their wonderful and very rich sharing. Um, thank you. I will hand over to Clive and I will see you at the end of the day at closing. Thank you.